So yeah, as I said, welcome. Um, so today um, we'll be providing um, some some theme updates. Uh, so John is going to give a brief update on the progress around the regional data transfer uh, platform and the transition that's underway at the moment. Uh, Brandon has some exciting news around mobility as a service. And Ken's got a couple of topics that he's been working on as part of the MIT team around reimagining infrastructure. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, Larry Gaudieri from Hillsborough County has joined us today as well to provide um, a demonstration, uh, an overview and demonstration of the uh, lane closure, road closure uh, tool that they've developed. It's, it's really impressive, um, to be fair. And then Alice is going to um, provide us uh, an update, uh, a view on some emerging uh, grant opportunities. Um, I will start just providing some feedback um, on the on the future themes uh, from the last workshop. But just to remind attendees that um, this workshop is being recorded, and we will share uh, the recording on the Tampa Bay Smart City Alliance website. And um, yeah, if you could um, put yourself on mute, just for background noise, and if there's any questions, please raise your hand. Thank you. Um, so Phil was um, going to provide this overview, but he's not feeling 100% today. So um, I've, I've stepped in and um, I'll just give a, a kind of be a brief background. Um, so at the last workshop, we brainstormed um, additional ideas, uh, projects, pilots, uh, concepts that we might want to consider as a, as a broader alliance. And we we built um, some of those around the, the, the core work themes as they stand today, that kind of the regional data platform, ability as a service and reimagining infrastructure. And we also added some additional ones as well, such as um, the initiatives around smart work zones, smart infrastructure and resiliency and, and three new ones, um, transport and education, transport and healthcare, and transport and hospitality. And we asked um, attendees both in the meeting and um, afterwards to kind of add new cards, new ideas to, to those themes. And as, as we've gone through and reviewed the, the output from that process, we, we found that actually there was, there was a lot of good ideas around um, those three primary work streams that we're working on already, including and the fourth of smart work zones. So there's some really good ideas, but they were really already aligned to some of the activity that was was underway. And there's certainly aspects that we can build on and, and expand upon as well. But one thing that jumped out um, out of the new themes, particularly was about transportation and healthcare. There were some really good ideas and it seemed that there was some um, immediate opportunities about how we could look at how to link transportation and healthcare together, maybe opportunities around equality or aspects around um, emergency response times. So that's one of the themes that we were keen to build on going forwards, um, where we're keen for a, a volunteer to, to lead that theme. Um, and also we're trying to arrange um, some specific meetings with uh, healthcare providers like Advent Health so we can really understand uh, from their perspective what some of the pain points are around how transportation could could make their life easier. So um, either now or after the meeting, if someone's got a real passion about leading that theme on behalf of the Alliance, then please let us know. Uh, but in the meantime, we will be um, building it out, providing a little bit more detail around the, the kind of scope that we're thinking of. Um, and also definitely arranging some of the meetings with healthcare providers to um, get a little bit more insight. So that's just a, a little bit of feedback that we want to provide uh, as part of that brainstorming session that we had at the last meeting. Any any questions or, or thoughts from around the, the virtual room on, on the uh, theme feedback? Cool. Um, I have a quick question. Um, are, are we going to be sending that out to everybody on the on the uh, attendance list? That's a good idea, Ken. Yeah, we can we can certainly do that. I think um, 
I think the website is still open, but we can send the, the screen catcher. Uh, I think Phil created a separate web uh, spreadsheet as well, actually, probably better with a spreadsheet. Um, I'll know that as an action. Yeah, might, idea. Just, might just be easier for everyone to see also. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think you're right. I'm, I'm squinting as it is, uh, looking at some of those details. So, uh, yeah, good idea. Thank you. Um, Okay, so if nobody's got any more questions on the future themes, um, I'll hand over to uh, Johnny, who uh, is going to provide us a, a, an update on the regional data platform. Johnny. Hey, thanks, Lee. Um, thanks, everybody. It's been a little bit of time since I've provided you with an update on the regional data platform, but I think everyone's already familiar with the idea that we're moving toward urban SDK. Urban SDK is a data and analytics provider that uh, developed a product that's more suitable for planning purposes. Over the past few months, we've been trying to arrange a uh, shared cost uh, with District 7 and all of the MPOs within the CCC region, which includes Hernandez, uh, Hernando Citrus, Pinellas, Pasco, Polk, Hillsborough, and Sarasota Manatee. Our idea is to split the cost uh, approximately 50% with District 7. So District 7 would take on about half the cost and the remainder would be subdivided uh, uh, by the MPOs according to population size. Um, that would tremendously reduce the amount of cost that each MPO would be paying into it if they were to purchase this on their own. And for a lot of the MPOs which have very limited budgets, this is really the only option that they have to acquire a technology like Urban SDK or any of its vendors. Um, there's really no other way that we'd be able to afford this. So um, many thanks to District 7 for stepping up and taking this on. I just got an update from Ken Spitz right before this meeting began. Ken is uh, chatting with some folks at District 7. Uh, we produced an MOU or a draft MOU identifying how the contract would be managed, what the cost would be, how long the data platform would be available, and a few other topics. And Ken has taken this to some other folks at District 7. I think he said that they were reviewing it to clarify how the governance arrangement would be structured and the time, the timeline. Uh, we initially formulated this as a longer term proposal, but it seems like it might be more viable to run this as a one year pilot project with the option to maybe extend it out into the future. The reason why we're uh, working on this as a pilot project is because it was recently told to me that Central Office has been working on developing a data and analytics platform in parallel to all the data work that has occurred in the region over the past couple of years. Um, all of that was a secret, uh, but we still think that it's a great idea. Uh, it would make a lot of sense for the state to unveil a data and analytics platform that all of the districts and all of the MPOs have access to. But even with the promise of this data and analytics platform being built by the state, there's a lot of questions that remain. Number one, what data sources will be built into the platform? What performance metrics will be available and who has access? Still not really clear if the platform is being built specifically for the districts or if it'll be made available to other stakeholders. So until we get answers to those questions, we think that it's in our best interest to continue pursuing the one year pilot project using Urban SDK and then having all those uh, the CCC MPOs in District 7 participate. Um, Urban SDK is a great tool. I've been working on arranging demos one on one or uh, uh, staff level demos with the consultants at Urban SDK and uh, MPO staff and District 7 staff. And a lot of those meetings have taken place over the past couple months. Um, the Urban SDK platform was built by folks who are very familiar with the data landscape within the state of Florida. So the tool itself is um, highly specific to the needs of MPOs. It covers all of the required measures that fall under uh, MAP 21. So it covers all of the safety measures, uh, the reliability metrics, CMAC, and uh, uh, pavement and bridge, uh, pavement and bridge quality. They've also built in 
a number of discretionary measures as well. Some of the data sources that they're using to uh, create these metrics include the FDOT Sourcebook, Mapbox, FARS, CDMS, Signal4, uh, the National Transit Database, and they've also told me that they have some OD data, so we're really happy and excited to be able to use that. Um, seems like a great tool, and it, I, I think that all the MPOs agree that there's a lot of value, so the only questions remain now are like um, what issues we may have to run into or what issues we may have to overcome from a governance and contract management perspective. We're thinking that if we get District 7 and all the MPOs to agree to contribute to this tool jointly, then the next step will have to be finalizing the MOU um, and someone needs to execute the contract. This is going to be a really big expenditure, especially for MPOs. Um, so someone will have to take the lead on that. I think that about sums it up. Uh, I guess the best way to summarize or synthesize everything I said is that we're still waiting. Uh, we're hoping to wrap this up sometime uh, within the next couple months. We want to have this project launched uh, shortly after the new fiscal year begins. Um, so there's a lot of work to do, but uh, is because everyone is committed to working on it, we think that we can have this complete. Any questions? Thanks, Jenny, a useful update. Um, Any questions from around the floor for Joni? All good. All right, that was easy. No, All right, thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Um, so yeah, Phil, if we go back to the, the slides and um, over to um, Brandon, who's uh, going to give us uh, an update on the mobility as a service pilot. Good morning, everyone. Um, Happy to uh, give you all an update on mobility as a service. I feel like I've done this uh, several different times uh, as we've had our quarterly meetings. And uh, just looking back through the timeline of how things have progressed, it seems like each time uh, I'm able to bring <clears throat> some uh, incremental change to the status of the project. Um, but today, I feel like we've made a much more significant leap than the last uh, quarterly meeting, and I uh, just kind of wanted to share an update with you. If you can, uh, Phil, are you driving for us? If you can uh, go to my timeline. So uh, this is a topic that obviously we've been talking about uh, since the uh, launch of the Tampa Bay Smart Cities Alliance. So I was looking back through some of the um, documentation and meeting notices and things that I had from uh, our group uh, and I saw that May 2nd 2018 was when our first uh, workshop uh, was held over in Pinellas County and uh, really right from the get-go mobility as a service was uh, identified as a key area for consideration uh, for a regional priority and um, um, among obviously those others that we're pursuing, um, we've we've really always felt like this was a uh, not a, not a, exactly a low hanging fruit, but certainly a high impact sort of um, um, setup for us to to uh, go after as a group. Uh, and in that in those intervening uh, months and years, uh, we went went out for uh, a request for information. Uh, uh, about a year after that, July 29th, 2019, uh, that was released. We had 12 responses, uh, and those really informed us um, thoroughly on the state of uh, mobility as a service as it existed then. It's it's probably matured somewhat since since that time, uh, but also the different um, strengths of some of the of the vendors that we might be. Um, more interested in uh, as a group that that suited our group well. Uh, so then fast forward another year or so. Uh, we uh, the date that that uh, Tampa City Council uh, really kind of put their seal of approval 
on our agreement with FDOT was May 7th, 2020. Um, that was a project participation agreement that uh, I've spoken about in the past that uh, codified the cost share of 50% 50, 50 between uh, the city of Tampa and and uh, the other 50% with uh, FDOT, which uh, I know several of you are on and, and uh, we really appreciate the um, participation uh, and, and the commitment to the success of this. Then fast forward, not quite another year, but January 4th of this year, we put out our uh, request uh, for applications. It's an RFA as opposed to an RFP. That's not a typo. Uh, we received seven responses altogether. Uh, ultimately, five were scored. There was a little bit of drama there in which uh, one of the responses came in just minutes late and I had to make an unfortunate phone call to them and say, um, I'm sorry, but under government procurement uh, rules, uh, two minutes late is the same as X minutes late. So um, we're just really not able to uh, move forward with this. Another one uh, dropped out after submittal because of a key personnel change uh, and then one of the five that was eventually scored um, was lost in the transmission. We went through the scoring process of the other four uh, and they said, hey, wait a minute, where's ours? Uh, turns out they had done everything they needed it to do. And as of Monday, we've scored all five of those. And at this point, we are at the stage where uh, we are uh, getting ready, ready to issue our notice of intent to award but I am able to share who the high score was uh, through that that uh, process of scoring the five. And Phil, if you want to uh, hit the big reveal, high score happens to be move it. Um, so we had several different aspects of the uh, request for applications that they came through, and and their their strengths really shown in a way that I think. Um, will suit not only the city well, but will suit the the whole region and will allow us to um, potentially expand beyond our our pilot. Uh, next, next, Phil. So the, the few things, I mean, I've, I've talked to uh, this group about uh, what was contained within that that request uh, for applications or what we had planned to, to put in it the last time around, uh, but we we put elements in it uh, uh, related to routing, wayfinding, uh, payment, and multimodal integration. And Move It really um, <clears throat> had a, a strong submittal that uh, uh, showed us that they are willing to uh, use their commercial off-the-shelf product uh, and uh, adapt it to our needs and, and put it out as a, a white label uh, application. They've already got an existing user base. You can go uh, today and download it from your app store. Uh, and while it won't have uh, the City of Tampa logo or the Tampa Bay Smart Cities Alliance logo on it, it does have a lot of the functionality already built into it. Uh, and it has uh, garnered enough use that we're, we're uh, essentially getting a head start on user acquisition for it. Uh, they have a modular approach. Uh, there are uh, parts of this that as we go through our uh, final scope and fee negotiation with them that we may say let's hold off on this uh, unless und and until uh, we go to a broader uh, permanent program or uh, take the next step beyond this uh, pilot. Uh, and then really just the, the ease of expansion. I, I, I Start, started to mention that they have uh, built in information from even agencies outside of the uh, pilot area. So our PASCO transit and our, our PSTA uh, transit feeds uh, will already be in it. Um, I think there's probably some, uh, as we discussed with them, there will be some uh, focus on how we present the information that we've got uh, within the pilot, how we how we basically uh, draw the circle and and um, make this pilot uh, not 
still useful, but still but somewhat limited in what we're presenting as being part of the pilot. Uh, next, Phil. So uh, I mentioned that we're right now in the uh, phase where we're getting ready to send out a notice of intent to award. Um, I'm anticipating because um, well the next the next step I guess beyond that is our scope and fee negotiation contract execution. Um, I'm anticipating this is a a little bit of a, a guess on my part just based on similar processes with um, with within the city. I'm hoping that we can get that within 30 days or so. Um, and because they have most of the functionality built uh, already, the development and refinement of the tool specifically for our pilot, I'm anticipating about a 90 day turnaround on uh, and then a one year uh, operation schedule for the pilot. Uh, our project participation agreement with FDOT sets up a 15 month pilot, which um, I'm I am uh, trying to set up the schedule to incorporate a year of operation and three months of other um, activities. Uh, so so beyond that, that's really all that we have a, a real uh, hard plan for. Uh, and so uh, obviously with a pilot, you want to take a step back and look at the horizon and see what's coming beyond that. Um, my hope and really the intent with the Smart Cities Alliance from the beginning uh, was to put this pilot out and then uh, assuming uh, a uh, proven level of, of use within the city uh, to be able to expand from there. And even if it doesn't end up being the exact same tool, uh, we've got a framework and should have lots of lessons learned for whatever the, the next phase is uh, and and so that we can uh, have have a region wide tool um, that uh, incorporates uh, information and marketing for uh, the whole Tampa Bay region and and even beyond that. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Lee unless there are other questions. Thanks, Brandon. Definitely exciting news and really, really good to see it um, come to life in the next phase. Um, any questions um, on, on Brandon's update? OK. Thank um, you, Lee. Thanks, Brandon. Really appreciate it. Um, over to Ken. Hi, everyone. Uh, I see we have quite a few people on here today. We got 30 or so. Um, attendees. And in case uh, you don't know who I am, I will tell you, my name is Ken Spitz. I'm the transportation planning manager for FDOT District 7 here in Tampa. Uh, also one of the founders and I guess still tri-chair of the Smart City Alliance. So to all of you who are new, welcome and we're glad you're here. Uh, so they asked me to give an update on uh, um, reimagining infrastructure, which is one of our three themes. So we're going to talk about that for a few moments. Um, first, I want to tell you part of where this all got started uh, from FDOT's perspective was with a group that we call MIT. It's the Mobility Innovation and Technology Team. And it's a multidisciplinary uh, team within FDOT uh, that we wanted to be able to advance projects and, and certain kinds of projects, projects that applied innovative concepts and state of the art technology. So we have folks from design, we have folks from traffic ops, from uh, like myself from planning and pd and &E. So we, we tried to bring different people together who were interested in these kind of topics so that we could push forward uh, projects. So if you can go to the next slide. As part of that challenge, as part of our team focus, uh, we came up with three specific areas of focus, somewhat like our uh, Smart City Alliance themes, and those are safety, congestion, and innovation, as you can see on the screen there. So we do have nine different um, projects that we have started, <clears throat> and they're in different um, different states of progress, I would say. Uh, and as you can see, there's two in green there, and I'm going to talk about those today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I believe the uh, Smart Work Zones is next on our uh, calendar, and that's going to be talked about after me. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So I want to talk about just for a few moments on smart corridors. So we've talked a little bit about this at Smart Cities Alliance. Um, and what we wanted to do with this project is take a look at both freeway and arterial corridors. Um, and so one of the first things that we have to do for that is come up with performance metrics. What, what do we mean? How are we going to use the metrics in order to determine what are the appropriate actions to take within the corridors that we've selected? Um, so the next stage of that then is to take that data, come up with concept designs for the smart corridor, uh, and then that's going to be based, uh, that's going to end in a concept of uh, operations, which is going to be based on a toolkit-based approach. And we'll talk about the toolkits in a moment. Uh, and then also we're going to develop a brand uh, and a communications plan for this effort so that we can continue it in the future. So we'll go to the next slide, talk about where the locations are um, for the corridors that we've decided to highlight. So for a freeway corridor, we decided to go uh, I-75. This is in Eastern Hillsborough County, um, basically from uh, State Route 54 in Pasco down to State Route 60 down in the Brandon area. And as you can see, what we've that what that does is that gives us a chance to also show some system to system interaction between I-275 there at the apex uh, at the uh, Pasco border and also with I-4. On the Fourth Street North Smart Corridor, we wanted to get a, a a we wanted to get a corridor that has all the elements uh, of kind of an urban system. We've got shopping, we've got residential, we've got schools. It's also a route that can lead directly to the downtown, so there may be some commuting patterns on that as well. It has transit. We want to be able to, um, as you'll see in the toolkit, we want to be able to include all the modes. So we thought this might be a good location for us to do uh, a study on this. So we'll go to the next slide. So let's talk about what those toolkits are. I uh, hope everybody can see these. I know they're a little small, um, but let's uh, look at some of these. So um, you think about what uh, a freeway toolkit might look like on a smart corridor, and you, and you know you think of the normal things, you've overhead gantries, some of the poles. But what are those things doing? What what is it that's going to help? How how are we going to get information from these, and then how are we going to use that information? So some of the things that we I won't read all of these to you, but some of the things that we're going to highlight here are active say active traffic management, um, lane control, um, variable speeds, or what they sometimes call speed harmonization. Um, aspects that we can do with the overhead gantries, adaptive lighting is always uh, something that we can do with uh, to. Um, react to the different uh, weather conditions or, and also day and night. Uh, so there's the ITS poles. Those are interesting because what you can do then, that's, this is where you're collecting a lot of your data from, whether it's closed circuit televisions, uh, cl uh, closed circuit television coverage, Bluetooth collectors, or a connected vehicle roadside units. And then down on the bottom, you can see we've got things such as ramp metering. Uh, we've got hard shoulder running. Uh, refuge areas. If you're going to have hard shoulder running, you do still need refuge areas then uh, in case you have disabled vehicles. Uh, and then connected vehicle uh, roadside units. Again, we would have those spaced along different places. Q warning systems. We do have areas where you end up with uh, backups, whether it's incident related or just congestion related on some of our interstates. You want to give warnings uh, as much as you can for folks there. Um, also, we've got uh, uh, again, the variable speed limit signs there. I will say there is a little bit of question on whether we can actually call them variable speed limits because um, there's a there's a legal question about whether they can be enforced. <laughs> so I, I like to call them at speed advisory signs, but hopefully the we'll be able to do something with legislation and then they might become actually enforceable. Uh, and then you've also got wrong way detection. So we'll go to the next slide, which will show the arterial toolkit. Now again, you'll see that there are some here, obviously, that overlap, such as the lighting and the, and the data collection, the ITS polls, and that kind of thing. But some of the other elements that we add with this are uh, adaptive traffic signals, so that we can provide better coordination uh, along the arterials. Yeah, also, uh, oh, also transit priority. <laughs> Oop, I think we're getting some feedback there. Okay, Tr uh, transit priority um, signals so, so that we can uh, advance uh, transit vehicles, whether they be streetcars or, or some other LRT or buses uh, along the route. Um, we're also looking at the potential for smart bus stops. Um, again, you can have the arrival time information, travel time information, uh, public Wi-Fi would be available there. 
Uh, again, you have your, your realm of connected vehicle, roadside units, wrong way detection. Uh, again, variable speed limit type signs. Uh, where else? Oh, well, here we find uh, passive uh, pedestrian and uh, uh, bicycle. Um, we, this is good because we, um, a lot of times, even though you'll have a, a button, say a call button, there are some folks that have a difficult time using the call button, um, whether they're um, physically challenged or visibly or vision challenged. Um, so passive detection is something that we're looking into and it's being tried in different places. I know we've tried it with some uh, of our bicycle crossings uh, in the area also. So that's another area that we can look at is passive detection. Um, we're also looking at uh, near miss incident detection systems and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, next, the video analytics. So with cameras at, at various locations, we can collect some of the data that we need in order to develop countermeasures uh, for some of the safety issues. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. Oh, this is cool, but this is where we get to be our audio video club here, right? So <laughs> I'll let you guys do that. You guys have control over playing the video. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if there was vid, um, audio that went with that. If there was, I didn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> so what you saw there was some of the elements uh, in the toolkit that we talked about. Uh, you may have also noticed in the lower right corner, it said smart link. That's kind of the working title that we're doing with the branding um, that still has to be finalized. Uh, we will also be doing a video, and, and I'm sure there will be audio with it, uh, voiceover, for the uh, arterial system as well. So let's talk about what the next steps are on the Smart Quarters project. Uh, we need to finalize the concept of operations for both the freeways and arterial. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be completing the video. I guess I should have read this, and then I would know the supporting commentary will be added then. Uh, we do want to go out and get input from key stakeholders, so we need to conduct some interviews. Uh, develop some potential pilot projects, and then we will complete a final report with recommendations. Do you want me to jump into the next one, or do you want to take questions on smart corridors here? I think it'd be, um, it'd be good, Ken, if, if folks have got questions now. I think it's a nice, nice kind of natural break. Uh, people have got any questions around the smart corridor concept from around the floor? It's a very quiet group today. <laughs> or are there synergies within the two corridors that they've identified for the smart corridor that maybe there's uh, projects already going on that we could take advantage of and team up with? Um, well, on the, I guess I would say on the fourth street, we do have um, the interconnection there with 275. And so the new Howard Franklin Bridge, I guess I would say that. Um, on the I-75 freeway with the uh, TB Next program, uh, there are probably um, very good uh, opportunities there for us to include some of these in that um, implementation, I think. So those are, I would say those are two. Yeah, just curious if the locals have um, projects in those surrounding areas um, that might have some synergy with those quarters. Pinellas County, say, for 4th Street, or um, it might be, I'm not sure if it's a St. Pete jurisdiction throughout there as well. Hi, this is Jacob Labutka with PSTA. I can throw in some two cents on that. Um, so I know we've identified some additional corridors in the future where we might put a um, BRT light type service. Um, I know we have identified 4th Street as a potential corridor in the future, um, but I think sooner than that, I'm not sure if this is a corridor that was considered, but um, if we were to do 
probably the next sort of BRT or BRT light service would likely be on um, 34th Street, um, kind of on the path of our 34 in between sort of the Gateway Largo area down towards uh, close to Eckerd College, I believe on the south end. Um, we're working with, uh, the, sorry, my cat is going on my feet. Um, we're working with um, <laughs> The local FDOT district office on potentially having um, business access and transit lanes or bat lanes on the south end of 34th Street, south of, can't remember the northern terminus, maybe 5th Avenue south or 22nd Avenue south. In any case, a few miles of um, bat lanes on the south end. So I think there could be some synergies along that corridor if that were going to be a potential um, candidate for this smart corridors plan. Hey, Johnny, you got your hand up as well? Yeah, Lee, um, <clears throat> this is a question for Ken. I'm not sure, Ken, if you're the right person to answer this, but I noticed that some of the ramps on 275 northbound, especially in St. Pete, have the ramp meters installed. Do you know what's going on with those? Is there something that needs to be done before they're operational? I believe that's for the hard shoulder running. Is that right, Alice? Bus on shoulder project is that the yeah it's the bus on shoulder project bus on shoulder thank you okay <laughs> and john you know we tested the equipment everything in the equipment's going good it's just uh uh you know make sure of driver training making sure we get out all the the media notifications and stuff we're not behind or having any issues if that's what your concern is i pass by them multiple times every day and i see that they're covered up with cardboard and I'm just waiting for the big reveal because I'm very excited. It'll be this summer. And that's that's the game plan. There aren't any issues. That's just our timeline so far. But we tested the equipment so far, so good. So great. Thanks for the update. There you go. Thanks for that, Julie. All right, Ken, I think. Um, OK, <clears throat> then we'll go to it. All right, thank you. We'll go to a video analytics then. So this is this is I, I know I've I've presented a little bit on this before. Um, the idea behind this, for those of you who are new, is is the crash data only tells us so much, right? That tells us the accidents uh, when an actual accident occurs, and also only those that are actually reported um, and and to through the system. So what video analytics does is what we're going to look at here are near misses, and the idea here is let's try to identify a problem before a crash happens. And then let's see what sort of countermeasures we would need to accommodate, well, not accommodate, but to, to um, uh, minimize and mitigate those kind of accidents. So the idea here is to take um, a video and then it's uh, run through computer-based uh, ana analysis <clears throat> to uh, predict future conflict frequencies and severities, and then develop countermeasures. The video collection is actually fairly simple. Uh, there are several companies now that are doing the video analyses. So the idea here is uh, we think we can probably get about 10 to maybe 12 for done under $100,000 and within a rather short time frame. So next, please. So, you know, one of the first things you have to decide is, well, where are we going to do these, right? What, what are the 10 to 12 places? So uh, we did go through um, the 100 signalized intersections that have the highest crashes that involve uh, incapacitation or fatalities. Um, and I don't know how well all of you can read this, but I, I can tell you that some of them are, you know, they're throughout the counties. So we've got, for example, SR 54 at Little Road, um, US 19 at Darlington, US 301 at Sun City Center. Uh, a lot of these, I'm sure, if, if you live in the area, if you're, you know, with some of these agencies, you've obviously know about these. And as you can see, uh, we have a high number of fatalities uh, in, in some of these locations. These would probably be the higher priority locations for these um, that we would try to do this. Um, we also, though, want to look at places where we maybe say have more. I think we're going to do it on the next slide, actually. Let me go to that one. where we also have pedestrian and or bicycle involved crashes. So it's it's not just where we have vehicle crashes, it's also where we have where they're interacting with uh, vulnerable users. So again, at the 100 um, signalized intersections with the most um, pedestrian involved crashes, these are the 10 that we've had. And um, you know, again, US 41 at Fowler, SR 580 at Lois, US 19 at Main Street, you know, you can see on. Uh, obviously, these typically are larger highways where they intersect. 
Um, and so obviously there are factors here that we need to look at um, and that we're hoping that with the video, uh, the video can run for 72 hours. It can run for a week if we want it to. <clears throat> um, the camera technology is getting to where we can run it uh, day or night so that we can not only collect for daytime incidents, but nighttime, I shouldn't say incidents, near misses. Um, and so we get an idea of how things are, are operating. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So this was interesting. Um, it may not be, again, politically correct, but it was interesting what we found when we started to look where these locations were. We did actually find a couple of trends or a couple of findings, I guess I would say. The fatalities were more common in areas where there were a higher percentage of elderly population. That may be the cause, that may not be the cause. Uh, and the pedestrian involved accidents were obviously more common in urban areas, that makes sense. Obviously there's more interaction uh, between vehicles, bikes and, and cars there. So it's kind of interesting. We do wanna look a little bit more into this elderly population connection, um, but it's, it's interesting. One of the things that we found out, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So the next steps on this, um, so we need to look through, uh, as I mentioned, we go through the data, compile the uh, site selection, complete the site selection for the next stage. Um, then we're going to have an invitation to bid for the video analytics, so the companies that do that. Uh, then we'll be deploying the cameras, uh, collecting the video, completing the analysis, and then coming up with countermeasures for each. That'll be detailed in a report um, that will then, um, our plan is, then to uh, get with work program and see if we can advance um, countermeasure actions at those intersections. Uh, and then review this uh, pilot for wider deployment elsewhere. The cameras are, um, as I said, they can be 72 hours to a week. Um, they're very, I, I was very intrigued to find they're actually very small cameras that you strap to a pole. You would hardly even recognize that they're there. Uh, the one um, thing that we have that's kind of a drawback to them is they, um, because of the small size, they use uh, SD cards. So you can run out of the SD space rather quickly. So they have to be visited fairly often. Um, but, you know, we're going to try out this technology, see what we can find from it and uh, develop some countermeasures. So I believe that's it for me. And I guess we'll take questions. Excellent, Ken. Really good updates on those two. Um, any questions for Ken again on either on the smart corridor um, study or on the? the I'm seeing one. Panel? I am sorry. I am seeing one in the chat here from Eric Hill. All oh, right. Okay. Cool. Uh, it says dangerous by designs reports high crash rates in minority communities. Will this be factored into the locations used? Yes. Yes, it will. Um, and uh, I did not put that because we had not yet finished the analysis on that. <clears throat> but yes, thank you, Eric. That is a part of it. Nick, Ken, this is Margaret Kiblins. Um, hey, Margaret. Hi, I had a question just um, which you probably are already on top of this, but I did, I was aware that in Pinellas with um, their Vision Zero program that they're also doing some video analytics and predictive crash information. And so I wondered if some of those crash locations, if there was any overlap. Um, so the answer to both questions is yes, we were aware of that. And okay. B, I, and two, I don't believe there's an overlap because I think we wanted to make sure that we did. And I think the one I saw was Belcher and somewhere which did not make our top 10 list. Okay, uh, great. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the Belcher and where, but. <laughs> yeah. Can you share who the vendor is that's helping you with this? Uh, well, we haven't got that yet. That's, that's, um, that's, the uh, invitation to bid, so we haven't picked a vendor. Oh, of course. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, got a question from Johnny. Hey, Ken. Um, it's great that the cam cameras are very small. Are they nimble enough to do a wider deployment, like a strategic analytics program where we could cover more than a dozen intersections over a period of time? Uh, I mean, like, I guess what I'm interested in is how did the costs increase if we were to expand this program beyond just 10 or 12? Right. Um, well, right now, the the way that it's structured is it's a per location analysis. Um, and 
and it, and it greatly depends on how many hours we end up of video, right? That we need analyzing. So it, it's kind of one of those things, the longer that you take video, the longer it takes to do the analysis, the more expensive the analysis is. So we, you know, when we when we come up with these site selections, one of the things that we're going to have to look at is, you know, is is this an intersection that requires 48 hours, 72 hours? You know, which days are we trying to get? Is it mostly a weekend issue? Is it a weekday issue? Is it a nighttime, daytime? So we have to look into that, uh, and the crash data will lead us on that. Um, okay, so what, the, the costs are more a function of the uh, time required to process the video. Is that right? I would say the time for the data collection and the processing, yes. Um, we also have not used this technology before. So we want to see what we're going to get. So part of the idea was if, if we had 100,000, we think we can get 10 to 12 in as a pilot. But yes, it's very scalable. If we find the the results you know, are, are good and we find, I guess, I guess in a way that the results are bad, right? If we're finding problems <laughs> rather than good, if we're finding problems, then we'll be developing countermeasures for them. So yeah, scale, scalability, I think it could be very high with this and, and we'll know more once we get the, once we get the pilot completed. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, Eric, Eric's got a question for you, Ken. <clears throat> Hi, Ken. Uh, hey, Eric. I, I decided to, to go live instead of just typing in my questions. Um, as you go out and put these cameras out, what kind of conversation are you having with the public um, on this? Um, you know, for example, you know, you there's this paranoia about privacy and mm -hmm. society, and as they see these cameras going up, there may be some shock involved. Is there any outreach um, to the communities on what you're you're doing in terms of a test, as well as getting the word out that this is a safety improvement to raise everyone's conscience on let's be better drivers, let's be more responsible pedestrian and bicyclists uh, mm -hmm. to reduce fatalities as well as crashes? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Thanks, Eric. Um, Part of the answer to that would be, yes, we are going to do some public outreach to this. We weren't so much thinking about at each location, for example, but, but maybe doing more of a general through the media saying that this is a technology that we're going to be using. So we got some feedback. Um, can we maybe mute the feedback? There we go. OK, the um, so yes, there will be some public outreach, as I said, maybe more in a general sense, kind of a, you know, here's some technology that FDOT is going to use to help improve safety uh, and, you know, that we're trying this out. Now, the other the other part of that is um, and I have not yet seen one. I've seen a picture of them, but I'm told these cameras are only a couple of inches square. So they're actually pretty small. The, if people are going to notice them, it's going to be more likely when they see somebody go up the pole to install it. Um, because there's a strap that goes around that holds on the camera. That likely would be the only time they'll notice them. Um, they do tend to go up fairly high. They can either go on the mast arm or on the pole itself, on the on the main pole. So usually most people, I would say most people are not even going to notice they're there. Uh, and But we are concerned, you know, obviously, as you brought up privacy, a lot of people are concerned with that. Um, these cameras, uh, you know, we do not collect the uh, license plate numbers. We're not looking for specific people in facial recognition or anything like this. It's a, it's kind of a wider angle, and it's meant just to to look at vehicles and, and the uh, and the sidewalks. Yeah, and just to follow up, um, we have been responding to the dangerous by design report. Uh, every transportation agency over in, in Orlando, we've been on high, not high alert, but you know. Um, damage control, if you will. But mm -hmm. just to uh, share the story that, you know, this is one of the ways that we're trying to address um, pedestrian fatalities, um, but safety, road safety, or child mobility safety improvements, um, just to, to tell the story, to get the good news story out, talk about how we're using technology uh, to be more efficient and more effective in, in what we're using or investing uh, our resources in. You know, mm -hmm. I just think that's a good angle, good optic. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's 
you know, the goal of this is, as I mentioned, it's not to count accidents or to see accidents. It's to see the near misses, right? The, the, the almost problems that we have so that we can react. I shouldn't say react so that we can act proactively, right? Rather, because I know that's a, that's a big public perception. People will say, and I've, I've heard it at meetings, you know, how many accidents does it take? How many injuries, how many deaths does it take before you guys will do something? This is an uh, this is a approach to say let's be proactive and find out where we have issues before something happens. It think sounds like an excellent idea. Um, so I think Julie yeah. had her hand up as well. Okay, um, Julie. Hey, Ken, yeah, this is just for more more of your knowledge. Um, I put up a lot of cameras for counts or cell cameras, cell modem cameras for temporary uh, traffic observations. Um, we typically do not get calls from citizens. I usually get more calls from citizens when I put up uh, intersection detection than I do about putting up uh, temporary cameras for uh, for monitoring yeah. things. So just a heads up yeah. for your knowledge. Okay. You get stuff, but it's, it's very rare, few, far between. Yeah, these these things are pretty small, and I, I want to say they're kind of squarish, and they're dark, so they they match up against the poles and stuff. So yeah, we we try to make them not look uh, too obvious, but yeah, I, they, I they don't that. they don't notice often. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but but that also has the you know then people might when they do see them they might wonder what they're for. So I saw that Johnny uh, had it in the chat. Uh, I think you're right. We we do need to make sure that when we do the public outreach for this through the media, that we let folks know that these are not for surveillance. These are these are for safety. That's good feedback. Any any final questions for Ken before we move on to the next section? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. No, thanks, Ken. That was really good. So. Um, little bit on works on data exchange and um, before I hand over to uh, Larry. So move forward to the next slide. So I just wanted to um, just give a brief update and I think Margaret uh, spoke about this last time as part of a safe trip um, initiative within District 7. District 7 have launched a data management pilot and the ultimate aim of the pilot is to introduce a, a works on data exchange by July the 1st. Um, and there's five main aspects to the project. Um, they have been working on developing an overarching data strategy. Now, that links really well with the previous conversation around the regional data platform, but really understanding the value of what data and bringing it together and what that could mean uh, for the district. As part of the uh, project, we've also been uh, looking at the business processes. So we've gone through a discovery process to really look at how processes are used in, in permitting, in maintenance, in construction, real time within traffic ops, to really have a, a grounding in terms of how the business process works, but also the data sets that are generated off that business process in order that we can understand what we can ultimately publish as part of the work zone data exchange. And the work zone data exchange itself uh, still work in hand in, in this regard, but I'm really focused on being compliant with the uh, US DOT initiative around work zone data. So there's a lot of work going on to, as I say, kind of build on the uh, business process to understand what we can publish externally. Um, we've had a recent knowledge exchange with Texas DOT uh, that also shed some light on some of the, uh, the challenges. Uh, so it was good to uh, have that peer exchange to know that we're and not on our own in terms of uh, what we need to do in terms of being able to publish. Um, another important aspect is about mobility as a service integration and, and the data. So it is really exciting that the progress that uh, Brandon and team have made uh, with the, the RFA and um, go live hopefully uh, soon. So we can look at how the, the mobility data can ultimately benefit SafeTrip and some of the uh, opportunities around, for instance, around travel demand management. And the final building block as part of the project is about performance reporting. So I have a very clear view in terms of what we want to achieve from the pilot itself and being able to measure and report on that, but also support the, the wider activity around safe trip itself and the, the metrics associated with the performance reporting piece. 
and it was through this work and I think conversations with uh, various different colleagues in the district, I think Margaret and uh, Amos at Hillsborough County, that we came across um, a tool that has been developed by Hillsborough County and I'm very I've seen it a couple of times I I'm, I think it's 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 really impressive what the team have done. So Larry has kindly uh, volunteered or responded to the request to uh, give us an overview of that tool and um, potentially a little demo as well. So I'll hand over to Larry. Good morning, everybody. My name is Larry Gaudieri. I am a GIS project manager for Hillsborough County in the data performance and analytics division. Um, this is a project that has been long going with me uh, in between the traffic management center and aspects of the public works department uh, at the county level and has gone through numerous evolutions over approximately um, six years. So uh, in beginning this uh, project, it was an approach to uh, a support function to this traffic management center um, where they were dealing with um, a lot of applications for lane and road closures on a daily basis <clears throat> and relied on uh, GIS mapping and uh, analytic support to help them uh, provide them with maps and uh, line features and GIS layers uh, to help them track their lane and road closures. Over time, <clears throat> They began to also uh, require the support of other agencies within the county to help them with uh, putting out traffic advisories, uh, such as emergency rate road closures or uh, things that would impact the public immediately. Uh, so <clears throat> if we go to the next slide, uh, it was finally approached in in time to overlook this whole entire workflow process, all the functions contained within and come up with uh, something a little more automated. Uh, we started out with a online PDF form um, that was available to the public uh, and they could fill this form out. Uh, and it, the form allowed for the contractor to type into it. Um, unfortunately, there were still a lot of aspects of the form that needed to be uh, filled in further by members of the Traffic Management Center. And what this re, uh, resulted in is uh, PDFs being printed, handwritten on, and then rescanned, um, and then sent out uh, through email attachments as ways of transporting those permits. Um, so there was a significant amount of administrative processing being done by the Traffic Management Center at the time. Um, about 90% of it facilitated administrative work surrounding of moving the forms from PDF to hard paper to uh, the processing that they required to actually do to the paper and then scanning it back and emailing it to the client. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, in our effort to migrate uh, their, their work functions and the data that they were using, which was uh, Microsoft Access Database at the time. Into GIS, uh, we formulated that at the bottom of the slide, you can see the basic elements uh, that were needed at the database level to go forward. So uh, we had a database where, <clears throat> you know, we had a certain amount of criteria or parameters and then that folded out to uh, what kind of lane or road closure or type it was. And then along process, we were able to create GIS lines for lane closures, road closures, and detours. Above, you'll see that I've highlighted the Esri ArcGIS online host and feature services. So really what the whole entire project <clears throat> distills down to are two published online GIS layers. And I'll speak a little bit about that from my organizational subscription to ArcGIS Online and all Esri products therein. We are able to leverage these solutions to county agencies and departments cost free because we have a ULA with the uh, Esri and the rest of uh, a, a few other contributing agencies to the county that allow us to leverage these GIS tools uh, cost free to our customers. Next slide. 
So internally, uh, we had some dependencies uh, along the way for about the better part of four to five years where we had some support from uh, geospatial services. We had dedicated upwards of two analysts over the six years uh, and the legacy support processes, as well as one to two individuals and another communications agency within the county. And with the advent or the rollout of this uh, GIS solution, we are able to discontinue that uh, external support and then put everything back into the hands of a two-member team within the Traffic Management Center. So this is kind of a general workflow uh, of how the public is being alerted through the efforts of those two individuals manipulating GIS layers. So we'll have uh, an inspection, I mean, excuse me, the um, updated traffic lane and road closures, GIS layers, and then the edits along with those personnel inside the TMC are being pushed through our, uh, what we call IIO, but that would be our IT division of the county is pushing that out to the public so that they can go to the county webpage and then look up a lane closure click on it and see a small map. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is kind of how we revised the process. Of course, it started with an application. The application is public facing. So we have uh, special events that are allowed by the public as well as uh, numerous contractors that uh, close uh, lanes and roads outright throughout the county every day. So what we did is we used a product um, that is a form centric uh, product and I can give a screen share or a demo to these things and how they appear. Um, in the background there you can see some some images that have been faded in and one of those is a, is a public facing online application. At this point the contractors and the public are asked to draw a simple line using this web application um, and then they fill out a form uh, requesting a permit to close a lane. Uh, once they submit that <clears throat> application uh, through some other GIS uh, applications that we extend to the traffic management center. They are able to see those new unapproved applications on a screen, on a map, as they were digitized by a public facing contractor or a member of the community. At that time, the TMC has work functions involved that help them make it, take it from an application to an actual permit. So we have what's called a web app builder smart editor widget. Okay, this is just a small workspace environment for that two member team. And one of the tools that we give them inside this little web workspace is something called smart editor. And smart editor helps them basically copy and paste the application from its application layer into their authoritative permit layer. Once they have done that, and then they've processed a few more questions and drop down fields like approvals, um, different, is it active, uh, is it a planned uh, permit, then they will go ahead and save that, <clears throat> and then that would trigger an inspection process. So the, the inspectors are uh, able to do many inspections uh, on any road closure in the field over the course or life cycle of that lane closure. Uh, and that is captured inside of an inspection table that is related to the closure itself. Finally, to accommodate the outputs, which would be delivering a bona fide tangible permit to the customer, um, this survey 123 offers a back end reporting function that very nicely puts out a Word document or a PDF uh, of the permit with all of the information that was typed in both by the applicant and any other further approvals by the TMC. And those can be emailed in a very lightweight way. Um, traffic advisories are also issued from here in those cases where there's an emergency lane or road closure, um, say a water pipe bursts and that has to uh, be alerted to the public. The traffic management center in our county has the ability to switch between a permit and an advisory depending on the situation and issue the same PDF that they can put into an email and uh, broadcast to a, a, a list that they have an email list. Next slide, please. 
on the supporting end of this, the metrics and some of the reporting aspects were supported by other uh, ESRI uh, items or solutions. Dashboards is one of them that we created that is actively reporting on the data in real time. So as the two members of the Traffic Management Center are processing applications and uh, approving permits, extending permits, canceling, uh, doing whatever they do as functions inside the Traffic Management Center, they are be reporting to this dashboard, uh, including how many types of permits are pulled within what communities, what communities are you know, uh, logging more applications for lane and road closures than others, and what are the activities, the work descriptions that are occurring at each of those. So those can all be summarized here. As you can see on the right, there is a mobile application associated with our efforts here, and that is one that the uh, traffic or the TTC inspectors use in the field. Um, and like I said before, they'll visit a particular site over its life cycle, and those life cycles extend from just a couple days to sometimes well over a year or up, you know, up to a year. And so this allows those instructors or inspectors to go back to the site and fill out a form centric thing using an iPad or a cell phone in which to give the traffic management center an update on the current conditions of that closure. That's all I have. Um, if there's anybody had any questions, I do have a couple screen shares. I can illustrate these or show these to you with any time remaining if you're interested. I think um, if we can do that, I think be, we've still got uh, a little bit of time available. If um, with full support, we can get the technology working. OK, certainly um, I can dance through this pretty quickly. I've set it up for you all and I'm going to share my screen here. Lee, just so you know, there is a question in the chat. Well, thank you. For some reason, I'm not getting the alerts. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's see. see what happens once they're posted to the county website. Can the public sign up? To, OK, so for notifications, we're working on two um, uh, Integromat or likewise. Integromat is a uh, more or less a, a web hook or a web trigger. Uh, service provided. So we would incorporate these two that let's say in those cases where we needed them uh, based on a certain status of the permit or the application, an email can be triggered. We don't know if we're going to let the public sign up uh, for those types of things. We do have other mechanisms internally that allow them to know when there is a zoning application opened within a buffer or let's say some other types of things that occur, CIP projects. Um, we have not developed this this far to have a public subscription for notifications. However, we are working on two other ways to contribute. And um, uh, the director of the Traffic Ma Management Center and the Traffic Operations, Brian Gentry at Hillsborough County, is exploring some ways for mobile alerts to occur uh, using some of the data we have. Uh, ICONS uh, is also another technology that we're looking into that would be incorporated here as well um, in terms of notifying the public. All right, let me see if I can pull up everything that I would like you guys to see here. And then I can show you very quickly what some of these things look like. Okay, one more time, guys. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Very simply, if you go to Hillsborough County uh, public facing website, um, we will look at how to apply for a temporary uh, traffic control permit or a TTC. Okay, so the user would search for TTC and quickly find this link next tab, which drops us out into a uh, site that gives us a little more information about the, how to do this. But the gist of it is, is that the requester would apply by clicking this button. Moving on to what the actual application looks like, it would 
dump the uh, person into this form. Okay, and it's a three page form and we have some instructions at the top. Basically, we're asking them to follow these instructions. They can search for an intersection or a street. And then they could go in. Sorry. Let's see if I can get in here and then they would pick this tool. Double click. OK, and then that would be the end of that. So we have a 3.3 mile and then they would go on to. Fill out the rest of this form. Now, if it's a lane closure, we'd ask them to specify a little bit more about that type of closure. <clears throat> Same with road. And then there are other types of closures. Work on shoulder maintenance of traffic those types. <clears throat> Organizational information is captured by a list that we have pre-populated. So a, a contractor can put his own information in there, continue to fill out the form, contact methods <clears throat> if they're working for somebody else. Work air direction, the location on the roadway, Description of work where we have several classifications that are canned, but if there are others, then they would be asked to. Uh, give a detailed work and description. The street where the closure occurs from street to street limits, the start and end dates and times. Maintenance of traffic by drawings attached or index indicated. 24 hour contact information, whether it is a CIP project for the county or not. And then after this, which if I would have filled this whole thing out, would go into a disclaimer page and then there would be an acknowledgement and an email address. In the TMC, this is their web environment, their web application that we built for them. There's a number of tools up here that help them accomplish their functions, including print, measure, a layer assembly, Unapproved applications, approved applications, active permits, inactive permits, or all. Field inspector assignments so that they can see where <clears throat> inspections are occurring across the county. And then a number of other tools such as the smart editor widget, which I spoke to you before about. And this is how they would move unapproved applications into approved permits. So looking at a section like this, we have an area where somebody has filled out an application, a contractor, and we can use the pop up and we can get the statuses of this scene in the pop up. I know this is a little difficult for some people. But we'll get some certain information here. There's other layers or other records that are underneath these that can be used as SARS inspector zones, community areas, service units are all reported in this small environment. <clears throat> so once they would do that, they would transfer those, <clears throat> excuse me, approved applications that would become approved permits. The uh, unapproved application will disappear once they approve it. They would process through that pop up, make edits to that. Through this. Once they're finished, they would save it. And then if they needed to, they could create a new feature. Select that unapproved application create a new feature, make sure that it's indicating the type of saving it. And then if we turn off our unapproved app, OK, it should have been there. My apologies, but there are some information that we didn't save to it before it be closed. But then essentially you would see that new application underneath there. The back side of the survey, the back end of the survey is how the Traffic Management Center looks at the applications. 
and also reports on them. So we have an, a record that is selected in our table here, and here's our summary readout. We can print this, we can edit this, or we can delete this from this environment. This is exactly as the application was typed by the customer. From here, we can use the reporting functions that are built in on the back end of this to produce. Here's a output, a permit output that contains a detour for a road closure, the street, the from street, the to street, the, the directions on the road, the start and end dates, and the client or customer information, the disclaimer information and the approval by the county TMC shown below. It's another look at one right here for a daytime lane closure with a right of way permit number, a traffic control permit number. Again, this was a new organization, one that wasn't populated on our customer list, but as you can see, they're given an opportunity to enter their information and then over time we'd add them to our customer database. For advisories, these are all templates that are made on the fly and excellent and, and act easily outputted through the back end of this environment simply by selecting whether they would like to use the permit with its approval status or the advisory template. Naming the report and indicating whether they wanted it to be a Word or PDF format and generate. One permit that we've looked at here takes about 29 to 35 seconds to generate. Over a course of a day, this particular traffic management center receives applications, sometimes as many as 42 a day. These are the weekends, obviously. And this also provides an analytical component for the traffic management center to generate a report and customize it to some degree. Well, we're waiting for it to generate down below, but you would see that there are quite a bit of information that is available um, to somebody who wants to report on these. percentages, counts of types, lane numbers, by contract or an organization, some of these are nonsensical and need to be eliminated, but you can see that you can get a whole lot of metrics here from the da the data that is collected automated automated by contractor or customer input on the public facing side and in a, a fairly automated process by the traffic management center one last look here currently this is something that's under development and revision by uh, the gis teams at our enterprise level is to redo our public way of showing what is closed and what is not. Currently, you could get onto our county website and find roads and lane closures, and this is basically what you get. So you'll get this long list of uh, closures happening with the dates that they're closed and when they're reopened. And if you click on the street, it'll return a quick map with a summary. So this will be under revision uh, in the future to show something a little bit more GIS centric, but basically what I've demonstrated to you is a process shown through the slides in the PowerPoint presentation of a start to finish and how the uh, organization is integrated through the public and internally and using a series of Esri web products that are easy to generate. And again, based on the PowerPoint, there are only two layers at play here. One is the permits and one are the applications. So with that, I'll conclude my share. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate it. Just as we're handing back, um, any questions for, for Larry before we um, um, continue the workshop with uh, Alice? 
Um, there was a question in the chat about uh, sidewalk and bike lane closures, whether those are also captured and transit routes. OK, at this time, there are no closures indicated for any of those. Um, those are going to be handled at some other level. I'm not having any information from, you know, internally that they're trying to accommodate for those at yep. this time. But that's a good question. Hey, Larry, actually, uh, the same as we would ca capture those under the MOT, which we would call MOT. It wouldn't be specifically sidewalk. Or, uh, bike lane closures, but we catch them on the MOT in their job description. They would have to write down uh, either sidewalk closure, bike lane closure, and provide a plan. I see. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. I understand. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I'm. I think it's it's really impressive what you guys have done in terms of building a a tool with kind of one version of the truth across the whole process from external applications all the way through to the, the ability to kind of use it within the business and also then publish externally to the public um, off one GIS system. So I, um, I think it's, it's really impressive. So um, yeah, kudos to, to the team there. Um, so uh, Lee again, this Amos again. So just so you know, <clears throat> Right now, we're working to integrate smart work zone technology into our construction, uh, into the county's construction work. So we're trying to require the Hillsborough County projects to have at least one smart work zone piece of equipment, whether it be a PMB or mm -hmm. arrow board, so we can actually see that job site in ways. So that's our next step we're working on. And I think there's there's probably some synergies there with um, some of the smart work zone thinking that's happening within the district as well. Definitely. So. Yeah, that's great, Amos. That's a <clears throat> great next step. We'll be sharing some lessons learned. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, maybe we can set up something uh, separately around that. and. Um, Certainly, if there's any um, follow up uh, questions or queries uh, regarding what Larry's presented, then um, uh, feel free to, to kind of either reach out to myself and I'll funnel them through or, or direct <laughs> um, to, to Larry. Um, I don't want to bombard him too much. So, um, Alice, apologies. I've left you with four minutes. Oh, no worries. No worries. <laughs> um, I appreciate everybody's participation. What a great set of sessions today. And one of the common themes not only is innovation and technology and how we use it for transportation, but for funding, um, the funding that we need. And, and as you could probably hear, DOT has been a, a great funding partner for many of these um, initiatives that you've seen today and, and others, and we'll continue to invest. But one thing that we wanted to kind of bring to light, DOT District 7, is definitely looking um, at a variety of grant opportunities to help support some of these initiatives and others as well. And we said that from the beginning of the Smart Cities Alliance that we wanted to be able to identify some synergies between projects where we could combine forces to better compete for some of these grant opportunities. And um, certainly District 7 um, with the new administration at the highest levels of our U.S. government is, is looking um, with eyes wide open at the potential, potential for stimulus. Um, we have definitely um, looked at hard at a couple of the grant opportunities as of recently with the infra grant and also are working on um, a build grant. Um, which publishes soon the infra grant. I think um, NOFA just closed like last week or the week before, and the build grant is, is set to publish soon. Um, and the build grant, I think, um, is the, the successor to the uh, Tiger Grant program, which um, the city of Tampa and, and other regional partners have been successful in receiving some of those funds. So that's that's really exciting. Um, so you're, you'll see D7 um, organizing through central office, really, they've done a great job of kind of pulling together um, resources to support, like there's a, a cost benefit component to, to many of these grants. 
definitely some of the um, other emerging buzzwords that we're hearing is social equity, resilience, and sustainability, and that cost-benefit um, uh, analysis that's um, required. And so, to me, the, all the things that the Alliance is looking at right now, many of these projects directly support um, some of those initiatives. So that's really, really exciting news. Um, and so if there are, you know, projects that you or, or grants that you are interested in and, you know, you think there could be a partnership opportunity with the department, uh, please do reach out because that's part of what we wanted this whole alliance to be able to leverage, you know, various projects and, and work as a group and as a team, um, again, to better compete for dollars that may be available. And um, right now we're preparing just a, a, a nice big list of the different grant opportunities and trying to pull a calendar together so we can better organize around them. Um, it seems like the NOFAs come out sometimes and, and we're quickly trying to react as opposed to being able to really think it through ahead of time and, and pull a really strong grant application. And I know Eric um, over in, in, in Orlando, you guys have been very successful in combining forces from that, from that area. Um, and, and in order to kind of um, secure funding as well. And then I know USF Cutter has, has been successful in um, um, re some of the research grants, and um, we were looking forward to bringing some of those lessons learned from some of those research projects back into the Alliance conversation as well. Um, I wasn't sure if any of the others, it's right at 12 o'clock, if anybody else had any other grant um, successes or opportunities to share. We'll just kind of leave it at that. And if not, we'll say more to come and we look forward to working with you to secure funding for these initiatives and in future. Oh, I see Johnny. Yeah, Johnny's the question. Alice, yeah, I just wanted to share that we have a recently hired uh, staff member, Jamal Wise, who's our agency's first uh, in-house grant coordinator. Awesome. And um, he has connections to this community. I think before coming to the MPO, he was working in the Pinellas County school system, working on uh, grants for for the schools in in, in uh, St. Pete. And we're very happy to have him. I know that he's already working on uh, identifying some funding opportunities for some bike walk plans. And I hope to touch base with him soon to get some TISMO stuff um, submitted. Absolutely, that's great news. Eric, did I see your, your hand as well? Yes, I just wanted to ask, what, what is the uh, likelihood or feasibility for uh, putting together a grant uh, that would uh, cover the central Florida area, uh, combining the three districts, uh, one, seven, and five? It, has that been done? Um, um, that's a good question. Anybody from the department want to, to chime into that? I know that's been a, um, a focus of yours, Eric, and, and a good question over the last few years. And I know you've done some rallying to some, some of the agencies throughout there. Um, I4 Frame is probably the closest thing I can think of. They just, yeah, you know, they yeah were that, that's, a good, that's a good example. That's mm -hmm. a very good example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ATC MTD um, funding that they receive, which um, should be getting underway. Here shortly. I'm not sure if any of our traffic, traffic ops team know about that, but um, I would say just from talking with District 7, we're definitely a willing, you know, participant in any type of kind of super region, um, you know, initiative to, to help, especially particularly along I-4 and, you know, connecting Orlando and Tampa. Okay. All right. Thank you. Al. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've got one in mind, Eric, let us know. I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you, Alice. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I left you with um, a short time. Uh, we always seem to overrun on these meetings, which I think is is kind of a good thing and maybe testament to the conversation. Um, so we are over time and I'd like to thank everybody for uh, their attendance today and in particular the uh, presenters for uh, preparing and spending time uh, providing their updates. So like I say, if you've got any questions or queries, uh, any follow-ups, please feel free to reach out to us and we will make sure that this uh, recording is updated to the Alliance website. So for now, thank you and keep safe. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.